just uh, bless this revival, Lord, with a special anointing, Lord, for uh, harvest of souls, Lord, for uh, strengthening the body, whatever we need, God. We, we look to you for that, Father, and we pray, God, for our service today, Lord. We pray your anointing upon your word as it goes forth, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the title of our lesson today is Dynasty of Kings Established, uh, and uh, our uh, central truth is the dynasty of the kings of Israel prefigured the eternal kingship of Jesus Christ. So our introduction this morning, uh, after the death of Joshua, the people of Israel descended into a dark period. The book of Judges chronicles the disobedience, adultery, violence, judgment, and deliverance of the children of Abraham. The end of the period of Judges marked a transition in the political life of the nation of Israel. With the appearance of Samuel, Samuel was the last judge of, in, of Israel and the first of a new generation of prophets. Samuel was instrumental in the calling and anointing of Israel's first two kings, Saul and David. In our lesson this morning, we're going to be looking at the the kings of Saul, David, and Solomon. So Joshua's life has ended from last week's lesson. Uh, he had replaced Moses at, as leader of Israel, divided the lands uh, uh, between the tribes and, and the people that took up residence. And, and after Joshua died, uh, the 12 tribes kind of kept a loose union, but... Uh, uh, between them, but as far as God, they they had seen they'd lost their way. As you read the book of Judges, as our, as our introduction has told us, they uh, had disobeyed Jehovah by allowing certain tribes and certain people uh, to stay in the Promised Lands. These people that worshipped idols and had strange gods, and they were a temptation to the Israelites in the Promised Land. So uh, by disregarding God's word, by not ridding the land of idol worship, they allowed those temptations to stay close to them. And as they lived close to these temptations, they strayed from God. Is there even a lesson in that for us today? Do we have, do we live close to temptations and things that maybe can pull us away from God. I think God's message to us is what? Is to live a holy lifestyle, right? And today we have all kinds of idols. We know an idol is anything that takes the place of God in our life. Um, people can even worship themselves, and that can be their idol. So it's up to us to rid those temptations, get them out of our life and, and not uh, allow them to stay around and, and, and pull us away from God. So the, the Israelites, uh, they would, they would uh, be afflicted by these nations, different ones, and God would raise up a judge as he heard their cries. Um, he heard them cry out. In their oppression, he would raise up a judge, a, a man or a woman, anointed, use of God. Again, not perfect, but, but use of God at that time. And, and they would, you know, deliver them from that oppression, but then they would go back into the same cycle over and over again. So, and the last judge of Israel, as our introduction told us, Samuel, uh, who's also a prophet. And, and in today's lesson, as we get into it, uh, we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter Eight, I think, yeah, verses four through nine. It says then all the elders of Israel gathered together. They came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, "Look, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations." But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, "Give us a king to judge us." So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their voice, however you shall solemnly forewarn them, and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel wanted to retire, 
uh, as judge over Israel. He appoints his two sons to take his place, Joel and Abiah. And they are nothing like Samuel. If you read, you, you'll see they, they're corrupt. Uh, they, uh, they're evil. They use the office of judge to take bribes. They, their, their judgments are perverted. And the leaders of Israel have said, we have had enough of this. And so they come to Samuel in his retirement, I guess, and they demand a king. They had had enough of corrupt leaders, of judges uh, that couldn't be counted on. They had forgotten the covenant that previous generations had, had made to Jehovah uh, to obey, to serve, to put him first. So God speaks to Samuel and says, Samuel, they have rejected me. Don't take this personally, this demand for a king. Uh, in spite of the great history, in spite of, of all the miracles that God had done for the people of Israel, the deliverance from Egypt, the, all the things that, that he had accomplished for them, uh, God says, Samuel, they, they've rejected me, so, so give them what they want. But give them a warning. Tell them what they're, what they're asking for. Uh, and I thank God for, that I, we know he's the truth, and he tells us the truth. And when you and I ask for something that maybe is not the best thing for us, I think God will let us know that as well, just like he did here for the Israelites, because, because he told them uh, through Samuel that this king that you're demanding, this king that you're wanting, this king is going to draft your sons and draft your daughters into service. They're going to be, they're going to fight for the king. They're going to be in the military. They're going to do hard labor. Uh, the the women will uh, cook and create perfumes and and do whatever, whatever they uh, uh, he wants them to do. And it's just, you know, you're to be taxed. Uh, your crops are going to be taken from you. Uh, your land, if the king wants it, he's going he's gonna to take it from you. And your livestock, your possessions, anytime he wants it, he'll take it from you and give it to somebody else. So, you know, this is what you're asking for. This is what you're wanting. And there's going to come a day when you're going to cry out for deliverance from this king that you have now demanded. And I'm not going to answer that call. So, eyes wide open. Here's what you want. Do you still want it? So what happens? We know what happens, don't we? 19 through 22, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we may also may be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, every man go to his city. So again, in spite of all this, Israel says, I want a king. Why? Because the nations around them, even the ones that were still in the promised land, that they were supposed to drive out to remove that temptation so, so they wouldn't have a negative influence on them. And yet they were also called, as we saw in last week's lesson, Israel was called to be a nation of priests for the rest of the world. A nation of priests proclaiming to the rest of the world, Jehovah, here's, what, here's how we serve Jehovah, here's what it's like to serve Jehovah, the one true God. And now... They are saying, I want to be like these other nations. That's what I want to be like. I want to be like all the nations around us. Um, I want to fit in, right? Do you ever want to fit in? Uh, be one of the gang, be one of the crowd. Well, that's what Israel is saying here. I want to fit in. Uh, I want to be like everybody else. 
Well, how did that get up there? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You, talking about God's children, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. King James Version calls us peculiar. That's okay, too. Peculiar. If you don't like peculiar, say you're special. But say you're different. Because that's what we are. That's what we're called to be. You may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So do we want to fit in? Do we want to be like everybody else, like the nation of Israel wanting to be here? That's not the right direction for the child of God. We're called to be special. Peculiar. Any comments here? Judges were temporary, of course. You know, they would, you know, book of judges, I don't know how many years, several years you're talking about, uh, several generations, and uh, the people would go into that cycle of, you know, serving God, you know, for a while, and then, the, then they would fall away from God, then came the oppression from, uh, from different, a lot of times the Philistines or other, other Steens or Ites would come in and uh, attack and steal, and, uh, and then God would hear the cries of the people, they would turn to God again, you know, and cry out, you know, save us, help us, uh, God, God is a merciful God, isn't he? I mean, you see it in the Old Testament. It's just, just not just in the New Testament. And he, he would raise up a judge, and, and that judge would lead the people, deliver them, and then things would go good for a while. But then, you know, you'd go back. So, so you read about all the, those judges. You know, it was just a cycle of up and down. Of course, when, when the when the king was appointed, as we know, you had the same cycle as well, right? It depended on, a lot of times it depended on the king, right? A uh, godly king, uh, the nation of Israel would, you know, would, would, would live, you know, good overall. But then here come a, an ungodly king and, and you, you know, they would follow him just, just as well. Um, but... Uh, but it was just like a, a period where a judge would just rise up or be chosen of God. And now, as, as we see the, the kingship established, you'll see, you know, even some of the prophecies start to come forth, you know, even from, uh, from the patriarchs and stuff, as we'll get into that. Any other comments? Let's go to, um, let's see, did I get that? Here we go. Chapter 9, verse 17. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, uh, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. Uh, this one shall reign over my people. So, so now God speaks to Samuel. Tomorrow, about this time, I'm going to send a man your way from the tribe of Benjamin. So, and when Samuel sees this man, you know, he, as we'll talk about more, in a minute here, he, you know, I mean, you look at Saul and you see somebody that is, hey, he should be king, right? So, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, he poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed your commander over his inheritance? So, so Samuel, as judge, anoints Saul as king of Israel. This, uh, this anointing here, it, uh, as, as this oil is poured over Saul's head, and, and this same anointing would take place over every king that, that Israel would have. Um, and it symbolizes, we know, with the oil, the presence and the power of, of, of the Spirit of God in his life, a reminder that that king has responsibilities and it's his responsibility to lead the people with God's wisdom 
and not his own. And, and God here, we, we, we still see God for Israel, don't we? I mean, in spite of, of Samuel's conversation earlier with God, you know, uh, Israel's not rejected you, Samuel. Samuel, Israel has rejected me. And in, in spite of that, you still, still see God for Israel here. Uh, still, it's God's desire for his people. And if the king, if this king Saul would have been obedient to God, God would have continued to bless him, his, his rule, his, the people. And, and notice that last part of verse 10. Is it not because the Lord has anointed you, Saul, commander over not Saul's inheritance, God's inheritance? So it's still, God still considers Israel his people, even though it seems that they have rejected him. So again, you, in, throughout scripture, you, you can just see God's mercy reaching out for his people. Uh, to, to come back, you know, and to, to turn to him, to be obedient to him. That, that's what God is asking. That's what he wanted from Israel, and that's what he wants from you and I as well. He wants obedience, and he wants us to, to serve him, to worship him. So let's go on and look at Saul a little bit more here, verses 17 through 25. I'm sorry for a big amount of scriptures here, but kind of we need them all, I think. It says, Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up, Israel, out of Egypt, reminding them, delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the hand of all kingdoms, and from all those who oppressed you. But you have today rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your ad adversities, your tribulations, and you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Now, therefore, pre present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes, by your clans. And when Samuel calls all the tribes of Israel to come near, of course, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he calls the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But look, when they sought for Saul, they couldn't find him. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further, has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, yeah, he's here but he's hiding, hiding amongst the luggage, or in this translation, hiding amongst the, amongst the equipment. So they ran, they brought him there. When he stood among the people, look, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. He said, to, uh, Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty, warned them what was going to happen again, wrote it in a book, laid it before the Lord, and Samuel went, sent all the people away, every man to his house. So Samuel gathers the, nations, the nation together to choose a king. Uh, as lots are cast, uh, you know, the, the tribe, the family, they're chosen, and finally it comes down to Saul. And he's hiding. He is very reluctant to take this responsibility on. He really didn't want the job, uh, but it was his. And again, he was, you know, his stature, he was majestic. He was kingly looking. He looked like a king. Just what, just what Israel wanted for their king. This is just exactly what they wanted. So they accepted him as king. And, and Saul had potential, really. Uh, because God would have used him. Uh, God would have worked through Saul. Uh, we know what happened at the end of his reign and, and, and all of that, but uh, when he actually decided to call on God, it was too late. Uh, you and I have potential. You've got potential. Just like Saul. Saul. Because when God calls you, and God is calling you for a work, when he calls you for a work, guess what? He will equip you. He will be with you. He won't leave you. He won't leave you, you know, without uh, what you need to, to accomplish what he calls you to, to do. So don't be like Saul, uh, because we know uh, from Saul 
uh, he he lost his his faith in God. He 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 failed. He became disobedient. And this slide kind of sums it up here. After becoming king, Saul became began military com campaigns against the enemies of Israel. This led to a confrontation with the Philistine champion Goliath. We know about that. The Israelite champion was Saul. He was the commander, head and shoulders. Again, he looked the part, didn't he? He looked the part, but when it came down to the challenge, he cowered in fear. Instead, he allowed a young shepherd, David, the son of Jesse, to challenge Goliath. Well, Saul's lack of confidence in God, his fear of Goliath, and other acts of disobedience would cost him everything. Anointing without obedience ends tragically. So there's the key, isn't it? You know, you're called of God, he anoints you, but still he requires us to be obedient to his word. You have to be. So what do we, what do we learn from Saul here? Uh, a lack of faith in God, it'll challenge us. If we let fear creep into our life, it's going to challenge us. It's going to challenge us. It's, gonna, it's actually going to bring us to a place where if we're not careful, we'll be disobedient to God's word. And that, that can be our downfall. So, so we, these, these lessons are for us to learn not only what to do, but what not to do. Any comments here? And that, and, and that, and, and who, who said, who was that said to, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, let's, let's go to the next king, David. Uh, 1 Samuel 16 says, and, and the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how, how can I go if Saul hears that he will kill me? But the Lord said, take a heifer. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to sacrifice, and I will show you what, what you should do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said. He went to Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, you come peaceably. He said, yes, I have. I've come to sacrifice for the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. He consecrated Jesse, his sons. He invited them to the sacrifice. Um, so now the Lord said to Samuel, no, it's already didn't switch, did it? There we go. So then 6 through 10, we see uh, that, that as Jesse's sons come, we all know the story, that they would look, Samuel would look on them, and surely this is the one, right? Uh, and God tells Samuel, don't look at his appearance, at his physical stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as a man sees, for the Lord looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So he calls, you know, all of Jesse's sons, and he asks, well, is that all of them? And he says, well, you know, uh, I've got, you know, David out tending the feet, uh, the sheep. And so he sent and he brought him. He was ruddy, bright-eyed, good-looking. The Lord said, Arise, anoint this one. And Samuel took the horn and anointed uh, him in the midst of his brothers. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to, to Ramah. So, so Samuel, you've mourned for Saul long enough. There's a time for weeping. There's a time for mourning. And then there's a time to get up. And, and, and Samuel, it's time for you to get up. God has rejected Saul from being king. Uh, again, it, his, his disobedience proved to be his downfall. So, so God sent uh, Samuel to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse. And there you will find the new king, a future king. And, uh, and Samuel, you're, you know, you're old. You've served me for a long time. But uh, I'm going to give you a little lesson here. Don't look at a physical appearance. We've already tried that. We tried that with, uh, with Saul. It just didn't work. So, uh, so you know, God looks at the heart. So, so again, 
Saul had the outward appearance of being a, a great king, but it just didn't work out for him. So did David's brothers, but they weren't chosen where David was. Uh, so, again, saw the heart of a true king for his people, being a shepherd for God. And that's what David was. And God's people are his flock. And David had the heart even to face the biggest enemy he could ever imagine in Goliath and, and defeated him. So, so we see there's, there's a difference between outward and inward, don't we? So let's look at that verse just for a minute. Chapter 16, verse 7. The Living Bible translates it like this, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by a man's face or height, for this is not the one. I don't make decisions the way you do. Men judge by outward appearance, but I look at a man's thoughts and I look at a man's intentions. So that should lead each of us to question, do we spend more time working on our outward appearance or on our inward appearance. Now I could say something funny like I can look out over the crowd and I can see some of you don't spend any time on outward appearance. But I wouldn't say that. So you must be spending all your time on inner appearance. That's really good. But I wouldn't say that. But, well yes I did, didn't I? But anyway, uh, so, but, but again, you know, think about that. What do we spend more time on? I, uh, an old uh, coffee drinker in, used to come by the store, uh, Cooper Long, he'd come in and say, well, where's, where's your wife, Eileen, at? Well, she's, she's at the beauty shop, but he wouldn't say beauty shop. He said Mission Impossible. So, <laughs> so he never, I don't think he ever said it in front of her, but anyway, you know, how much time do we spend on our appearance? How much time do we spend on our physical appearance? Now, how much time do we spend on that inner appearance? That, that's a lot more important. We need to commit ourselves maybe to working more on that. And I'm talking to myself here now. I need to spend a lot more time working on the inner part, right? The part that God looks upon, the part that God sees, and the part that God tells you is, is a lot more important. Any comments here? Okay, First Chronicles chapter 17. It came to pass when David was dwelling in his house, David said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains. And Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not, not build me a house to dwell in, for I have not dwelt in the house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent, from tabernacle to one tabernacle to another. Wherever I have moved about with all Israel, uh, have I ever spoken a word to any of the judge of Israel whom I commanded uh, to shepherd my people, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Uh, therefore, thus say to David, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you've gone, cut off all your enemies from before you. Uh, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, will plant them, they will dwell in a place of their own, move no more. Since that time, I, the time I've commanded judges to be over my people Israel, also I will, I will subdue all your enemies furthermore. I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. So here just a minute we'll stop. So, uh, so as Samuel had anointed David king 15 years, he becomes king over Judah seven years later. The, the, all the tribes come together and make him king over Israel. Uh, David from the house of Judah. So David reigns over Israel. Uh, for the nation as a whole, it's a very successful reign. You know, we read about it, you know, and uh, all, the thing, all the great things that were accomplished. Uh, Israel becomes a great power. 
uh, enemies are defeated, and all from the humble beginnings of the shepherd. And that's where he began, tending sheep. Uh, but he had God's anointing, and and he had David had the heart to worship God. And now David is considering, you know, after all the great things that God has blessed him and Israel with, you know, it's not right that I'm living in this great mansion, this palace, and, and God's, the Ark of the Covenant or God's presence is still in the tent, in the tabernacle. It's not right. And he talks it over with Nathan the prophet and David has such a desire to, to build God a house, a permanent structure, a temple. And, and here again, after all of David's successes and, and his failures, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, I love the Bible because the Bible's honest. Uh, you know, none of us are perfect. Not even the guys, gals, the men and women we, we read about in Scripture. Um, now you will not build me a house, uh, even though it's your desire to do so. Uh, but let me tell you about your house. God is so good as he's fulfilling his prophecy here. It shall be when your days are fulfilled. David, when you must go to be with your father, said, I will set up your seed after you who will be of your sons. I will establish your kingdom. Now your son, he shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you. I will establish him in my house, in my kingdom forever. His throne shall be established forever according to all these words and according to all this vision. So Nathan, Nathan spoke uh, to David. So God turned it around. It was David's desire to build God a, a house, a permanent structure, something that would last, something that, that, you know, that, that had a foundation. And God says, let me tell you about your house that I'm going to establish, David. Uh, your son's going to follow you on the throne. He, he, he will build this house that you're talking about for me, but your house, your family will continually be on the throne of my nation, Israel. And God established this covenant with David here, and from his lineage, we, we know that Jesus Christ uh, springs forth. Uh, the relationship that God had with David the same relationship he wants with you and me. The same one. His grace, his mercy, ever extended, mm -hmm. that we so desperately, desperately need. So God, uh, David did prepare for the building of the temple, building of the house, and he did everything he could. And thinking about establishing David from the tribe of Judah on the throne forever. You look back, you know, we talked about the patriarchs last week. Um, so here's a prophecy to Jacob. The, the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, Genesis 49.10, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people, the establishment of the house of Judah upon the throne uh, of, of Israel and and again you know you see God's work come to pass you see you know prophecy uh, coming to, t to pass so and you look at David's reign and you know even though you know his reign was very successful we know there was he had issues as well didn't he uh, again the Bible's very honest one day David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. He was, should, have been, he should have been out on the battlefield. He was lifted up with all things under his feet as he surveyed his capital city. He saw a beautiful woman bathing, Bathsheba. We know what happened there, adultery, murder, uh, while the shepherd king with a heart after God, right? He had, you know, he had the heart of God. 
And he did finally repent, but yet there were still consequences to those actions. Uh, his first child died. Son Amnon ra raped his half-sister Tamar. Absalom avenged his sister, killing Amnon. Absalom rebelled. We know he was killed. There's just a lot of tragedy there in the midst of all the success that, that, that David had in his reign. So even though David's house was in disarray because of his sin, God did preserve the dynasty. Uh, David was not cast from the presence of the Lord, but sustained by the Lord's gracious hand. Again, God's grace, right? Um, you know, none of us are perfect, but we can all look to God for grace and mercy when we need it and call upon him, just like David he did here. Uh, but yet, keep in mind that sin has consequences, as we know from David's story as well. Uh, so it's best to not sin, right? It's best to not have to call on God's mercy and grace. Uh, I'm glad it's there, but uh, again, by being obedient to God's word, we can stay close to him. We can get rid of those temptations, those, those weights that the New Testament talks about that so easily can beset us. Let's shut them off and get rid of them and, and stay close to God. So our last uh, king we're going to talk about here is Solomon. Second Chronicles chapter 1, verse 6, And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. So David's reign was is drawing to a close. Uh, God chose Solomon to be king. It took a little uh, po political maneuvering that to, to get that done, uh, but, but Solomon did take control, and his first act was to bring the nation together uh, to worship in a time to renew uh, Israel's covenant with Jehovah. And, and here you see by this very act that, that Solomon, at least at the beginning of his reign, chose the nation uh, his desire to be like his father David by offering, you know, a thousand burnt offerings. You know, he's, he's seek, you know, he's uh, he's seeking, you know, the heart of God here by by worship. And then you go on to chapter six, verses one through six. And uh, so that at this time Solomon has completed the building uh, of the temple. Scripture tells us it took about seven years, and it was a a magnificent structure and as they celebrate with the dedication of the temple you know scripture again tells us that you know God's presence so filled that place that that even the priests couldn't stand and 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 worship and they couldn't uh, minister for the glory of the Lord that filled the place and and then Solomon blessed the temple here he blessed the people uh, and verse 6 again we see uh, the reaffirmation of the covenant God made with David, yet I have chosen Jerusalem that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. So again, you see how the house of David is established as, as ruler over Israel. And then uh, the last part of our lesson here from uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Uh, so Solomon, again, in the early part of his reign, uh, you know, we, we know he asked for wisdom, he asked for knowledge to be able to go in and out, you know, in front of the people. In other words, to rule properly over this nation. And God honored that request. He, he did. He, he honored that for Solomon. And we know that because uh, we see it here. He, he, and as he was given that, uh, it says here that the, the Queen of Sheba had heard about the fame of Solomon worldwide the the his kingdom how, you know how he ruled his wisdom and knowledge the the things that he decreed the decisions that he made she couldn't believe it so she had to come and see for herself seeing's believing right so she come she saw she acknowledged the last part of her lesson here uh she acknowledges that solomon your kingdom boy it's it is it is great it is something else uh, it, it is everything that has been described to me and more, uh, your wisdom, the things that you do, but 
guess what? Verse 8, blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne to be king for the Lord your God because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. So this stranger sees enough in this kingdom to acknowledge that it is God that has placed Solomon here. It's God that has, uh, that has blessed him with, with all of these many things that, that's going on in the kingdom. And, um, and yet we know what happened to Solomon as well, don't we? So again, the Bible's very honest with us. Uh, so in, in each of these kings that we've talked about, we see one thing that's so very important, and that is to say, stay obedient to God's word. It's a very simple message. Uh, it's very plain, too, as you see the lives of these different kings and, and, and different things that happened to them, their successes, their failures, uh, and how important it is for us to call on God's mercy and God's grace when we need it. Acknowledge, uh, seek God, you know, for yourself when 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 you need it and he will be there he will god's mercy you see it all throughout israel's history how every time they reject him he you know he's still reaching out still wanting them to come back it's the same for any soul uh today right looks like our time's about gone we appreciate your comments and your attention this morning I hey, want to welcome everybody this morning. Glad to have you with us. Got a nice, good crowd this morning. 
and we just appreciate you. They're all of them glad to come back, and that's the way we like you. We like like say a church house full, don't we? We just do. We just appreciate you. We'd have Sister Betty Schaefer revival starting this morning, so I hope everybody's in the revival spirit, and we're looking forward to hearing her later. And uh, good to have Maureen back from her trip. Good to have her back, and Jeff and Cindy, Jasper, they here. They was here earlier. Mason, we wonder. Uh, out there, Mason. <laughs> but we are. We're glad to have them back with us. We really miss them. They've been sick a long time, but uh, glad to have them back with us. And we are always glad to have all of our visitors. I uh, got a card to read here for the church. It says, You're wonderful. I'm so thankful for all the warmth, care, and love that God put into her heart. And uh, she says, this is to my wonderful church family. And she says, thank you all so, so very much for the beautiful throw. I will cherish it and thank for all the prayers for my sister Gladys. And it's from Sharon Coffey. She wanted to just thank everybody on the up. Okay, we're going to turn it over to our pastor. <coughs> How many are glad that we're in the house of the Lord today? Can you say amen? And let's give the Lord a praise. He got us up this morning, started us on our way. And I tell you what, I'm, I'm ready for revival. I need revival. The pastor needs revival. All of us. And so we're excited to have Sister Betty Shaver with us. Let's give Betty a hand of welcome. Betty, this is home for you for the at least for the next few days. So until God turns you loose, so we're we're glad to have Betty with us. But it's so good to see your faces. We miss you, and it's just good to uh, see you. I wonder if if you could just pull your mask down for a minute and turn and smile at your neighbor. Does anybody need a, a smile today? Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I wanted to share some devotional scripture. We, we've got to get ourselves in the right mindset. We've got to get out of the world's mindset because all it wants to do is fuss and fight. But God made us one through the blood of Jesus. We're God's kids. We belong to Him. We're of the kingdom of heaven. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. And we've got a lot to praise Him about today. Jeff and our uh, singing team is going to come and lead us here in just a moment. But I want us to understand today, if you're a child of God, God didn't save us to just sit and fill up a space and take in oxygen. He didn't save us just to fill a seat. He saved us to lift our voice and everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now let me just paint you a picture of what happens in the heavenlies when we start singing and praising the Lord. God looks at the devil who was originally created to sing to God. He, he, Satan, Lucifer, was the uh, worship leader. He, he had music built into him and was constantly praising and singing and worshiping until he fell, until pride came into his heart. Well, guess what? God came along and created you and I, breathed into us the breath of life, and He created us to praise Him. And when we start singing and start praising the Lord, I think the Father looks over at Lucifer and says, listen to that. And the devil says, ooh, they're singing again. They're singing about God. Ooh, don't sing, don't sing, don't praise the Lord. And you know what? When we begin to lift our voice and that breath of God that's in us begins to praise Him, you watch the devil be put on the run. Amen? It's in the Bible. Now listen to these scriptures. I want us to stand. Listen to these scriptures. This reinforces what our purpose is in life is all about. Psalm 47 and 6. 
sing praises to the Lord, sing praises, sing praises unto the king, our king, sing praises. How many times in that little short verse did the word sing praises? How many times? Can you count it? Four. Four. You think he's getting the point across? Sing praises. Hey, what about Psalm 68, 32? Listen to this. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises unto the Lord. Selah. Stop, think about it for a moment. Sing praises to the Lord. Psalm 147 and 7. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Anybody in this room got anything to be thankful about today? I sure do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, come on, Brother Jeff. Sing unto the Lord. Sing praises unto the Lord. Let the praises reign. Let's worship the Lord today. Blessed be the name. Give the Lord another praise. Praise God. Brother Cornette read all those scriptures. We're going to have to change a song, Brother Danny. Can you pull up? I just came to praise the Lord. We don't even know what key it is. We're going to do it. How many came to praise the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. talking to me about that song this morning, so we just did this. Let's sing, I've been a new world.
After those songs, you ought to be ready to worship, shouldn't you? Ain't nothing like singing to the Lord and praising Him to, to lift up your spirits this morning. We're going to take up a prayer request, and of course, we want to continue to pray for Brother Adrian Wheat, just to continue praying for him. And Brother Nathan, still missing him. Still waiting for the Lord to touch him with healing for his back, and, and just continue to hold him up in prayer. Do you have any other questions? Brother Joe, uh, our, one of our teenagers, Sister Allie Mann, chest pains this morning. They've got her at the emergency room of the hospital right now. And she is, by the way, watching our service while she's there. And I'm praying for her. Yes. We're praying that God would touch Allie. Yes, let's yeah. pray for Allie. Just really hold her up in prayer. Remember this, remember Sister Virginia. Okay. Remember. Yes, remember these two. Others this morning. Do remember Audrey or Aubrey Johnson family passed away this week too and just hold that family up in prayer. Any others? Yes, remember her. Yeah. Okay. Others this morning? Okay. Just uh, and also we've got a revival. We really want to be a praying for it. And, and get out and invite people and then and uh, this is this is every time need revival. It is now, so invite everybody you can, and let's have a really good revival. Okay, let's all stand and take these needs requests. Lord, we come to you this morning, so thankful, Lord. We can come to you. We're able to come to the little house, to worship and praise you, lift your holy name up. Lord, we're so thankful for the good health you've given us love for one another. And Lord, we come to you on behalf of these precious requests. Lord, these are needful ones. These are people, Lord, that are hurting. They need a touch. Lord, it's all a touch that only you give. Lord, we, we pray for Brother Adrian. Lord, just touch him, Lord. Lord, whatever caused these strokes, Lord, cause them to cease. Pray for Brother Nathan Skag, Lord. We need our clerk. Yeah. 
Okay, we're going to take up our tithe and offering. We're going to ask Brother Cornette to pray the blessing over the offering this morning. Praise God. Heavenly Father, I just feel you're going to do great things today in this revival, God. Lord, we offer ourselves to you, Lord. We bring our substance to the altar and place them in these offering buckets. But God, we worship you today. We lift up your holy name and have a confidence that you are going to pour out of your spirit and meet every need, Lord, and work wonders and miracles and signs and great things for your glory and for your honor. Thank you, Father, that we have an opportunity to give, to worship you in our tithing, to give in our offering, Lord, to bless Sister Betty. And Lord, we just believe, Lord, that great things will come to every family and every loved one in Jesus' name. And would you join me in an amen? Amen. Okay, we're going to ask everybody to come up and bring your tithes, y'all. Before the praise team comes, I do want to, it's in the bulletin, but again, emphasize, if you're not registered to vote, you're eligible to vote, register. If our nation ever needs righteous people to arise up and to speak and to vote, it's today. It's in our nation today. But greater than that, we need to pray for our nation. How many love America? I love America. I love this nation. This nation has been a blessing to many nations and is a blessing to Israel. But the enemy has got a bullseye on our nation. But God is in charge. And I love the Lord today. We are one nation under God. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Thank you for your giving today. And let's worship the Lord after the praise team sings. The children will be dismissed. They can go on to their children's church. Sister Betty's going to come. And we, wanna, we just want to worship the Lord with her as she comes. And she may even sing this morning. I don't know what she's got planned. But uh, uh, other than I know she's got a red-hot sermon ready to preach. So, amen. Let's give our praise team a great big hand. They've been a great help this year. They've been a blessing. Is it okay to brag on you?
chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awake in your Amen. Put your hands together and praise the Lord. Well, glory. All things are possible. Am I here by myself? I said all things are possible. All things are possible with the Lord. Aren't you glad for that this morning? Now, I wish you was in my position. Coming into church. Don't know anybody, and they don't know me. And you've looked me over well enough now. We're going to worship the Lord. Where did my piano player go? My, my, my. Well, is she doing something else? Well, come on, sister. I need you. <laughs> Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Aren't you sick of COVID? Aren't you sick of the government? Aren't you sick of politics? Aren't you glad God doesn't change? He's not voted in. He's not voted out. Praise the Lord. It's good to be with you here this morning. And I want you to know I love the Lord and I love you even if I haven't met all of you yet. I love you and I thank God for you. And I'm not here to do anything but just worship the Lord with you. I'm not here to perform. I'm not a performer. I'm not here to try to do something different that no one else has ever done because if you've been in ministry as long as I have, you've seen a lot of what everything and what you don't want to see. <laughs> so I thank God that Jesus said, if I, come on, be lifted up. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Praise God. Sister, do you play by ear? Praise God, you the best kind. <laughs> Put it about down in G. Would you this morning? I know you'll know this one. I want to see if I'm in Church of God Pentecostal Church this morning. I love the lesson this morning. I love the lesson. I listen. I love the word. The teacher. I thought he was going to get on my message for a little while there, but. We want to be like everybody else. We want the downtown people or the surrounding area to know that we've moved from across the tracks and we're the elite. But I got news for you. Pentecost is the same. It's never changed. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it kind of goes like this. Oh, wood. Oh, it's going to maybe, maybe put a D. I love D. Uh, 
Oh, would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the... Yes, well, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, is it? Of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood. I got news for you. Well, glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me. Glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me. Glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me. I know it was the hand of the Lord. So let's just praise Him. Praise Him. Oh, praise Him in the morning. Praise Him in the new time. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him when the sun. Why? Why? Because there's power. Power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there's power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Now, would you give him a hand clap of praise? I promise I won't preach till one o'clock if you'll just worship. Praise the Lord. Sister, if you'll stay close by up here by me, and I'm going to slip over there. And if you happen to know what I'm singing, I'm going to get up and you're going to take over. How's that? Y'all know you sing it if you want to, or you can stand up and sing it. When you get old evangelists, you get old songs. <laughs> and I sure can't play like her, so if she can play it, whoo! I'd be glad for her to take over when I'm playing in G. <laughs> this song has been on my heart. Does this go down? Please remove it. I'd like to see who I'm playing to. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. This song has been on my heart, and I haven't thought about it for years. But here it goes, okay? And I haven't sang it for years, so you're in for it. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. Oh, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers flow. You know it? Oh, he land oh yes you know he hideth my life in the depths of his love and he covers <laughs> me there with his hand oh he covers me there with his hand now just, just keep playing a little bit about 17 plus months ago the Lord just took my best friend home sitting in a restaurant eating and laughing and talking after 57 years and I said are you alright he said I am and he looked up and was gone sitting right beside me in the seat Ah, but he hides my soul. <laughs> Whoo, glory. Did you cry? Yeah. Do you weep? Yes. <laughs> 
but oh he hideth my soul in the depths of his love and its shadows a dry thirsty land and he hideth my life <laughs> Me there with his hand. I don't care what you're going through. He'll cover you there with his hand. I said a wonderful Savior. Do you believe that? Is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior He is to me. <laughs> he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I do you know this song? Would you just stand right now? He hideth my soul in, in the, the cleft of the rock, rock and its shadows a dry, thirsty land. You know, He hideth my life in the depth of His love. And he covers <laughs> me there. Ooh, hallelujah. He covers me with his hand. hand. Oh, yes, he does. Thank you, Jesus. He covers me there with his hands. Father, I love you this morning. I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for this door of opportunity just to share the precious word of God. We're asking for revival. Lord, we can't bring it, but we know you can. We can't refresh your people, but we know you can. We know we're in perilous times, and we need to be hid in the rock. We need for you to overshadow us this morning. And in Jesus' mighty name, I pray that you'll bless the word this morning. Amen and amen and amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? I know you know you've got the best. You may be seated, but thank you, sister. I hope you're here every night. If you're not, I'm gonna find you and bring you. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Praise the Lord. Uh, and the praise team sang one of my favorite songs this morning. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Woo! Anybody believe that? Hallelujah. Now, it's hard to start revival on a Sunday morning. I started to tell Brother Cornette, but I have such respect for him. Brother Cornette, let's start on Sunday night. Yeah, it just seemed like people are more evangelistic on Sunday night, but I didn't do that. He said, I want you to start Sunday morning. So here I am in obedience to him that's over me in the Lord. Praise God. I want to speak to you this morning. God has dealt with me. I've prayed about this revival off and on all week. And I, I've said, God, things are different now. Atmosphere is different now. The world is different now. And the church really is different now. We've been hit hard. And uh, I want to just tell you, God has dealt with me all week, and you hear me say it all week long probably. Where do we go from here? What do we do from here? What do we turn to now from here? Now, when you uh, advertise revival, don't tell them you have a woman preacher. Because I'm not a woman preacher. And that'll help you. Just say, we've got a lady minister. And that, 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 softens the blow just a little bit. But I want you to know that in Exodus, I hope I gave you the right scriptures, and if I didn't, just don't read them. <laughs> oh. 
But in Exodus, the 20th chapter and the 19th verse, it reads like this. And they, the children of Israel, said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But now listen to what they said. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you. He's come to test you. Oh, golly, Lord. I could just woo, preach right there. I feel the spirit when I said it. God's come to prove you, church. He's come to test you to see, are you really still his children? Are you still praising? Are you still thanking? Are you still worshiping? Oh, my Lord, I don't mean to get wound up too fast. Oh, he's come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. Oh. We are just like the children of Israel here. They're in a new place. They're in a new atmosphere. God's brought them out of where they've been for years and years in slavery. He's opened the Red Sea. He's fed them. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. They had everything they need. But here they are sitting in the middle of the wilderness doing nothing. Y'all stay this quiet, I'll preach all day. You better say amen. Oh me or something. <laughs> he will see. <sneeze. laughs> but I want you to know that I just wonder, as God was talking to them, this is when he gave them the Ten Commandments. And to us, it's like something that you just put on a wall. And you look at it and you say, memorize it, kids. And I dare say some of us can't rattle them off today. Boom, 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 what the Ten Commandments are. But you talk about the top ten list, God's got one. And he's got the first one. And it's lasted forever. And it applies to us. And it gives us principles of life to live by. And when we're in a darkness and when we're in a valley and when we don't know what decisions to make, God says, come here. I want to talk to you. I, I've got something to say to you. And a lot of us are just like the children of Israel. We've really not walked as close as we ought to. And we haven't been just where we ought to be. So we back up and we say, wait a minute, Brother Cornette. You talk to God. <laughs> you talk to God and then, then, then you come and talk to us. We don't want to talk to God because we fear him. Let the fear of the Lord fall upon the people one more time. And let us see the hand and the power of almighty God. Oh, hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Let us see the lightning if we have to. Let us hear the thunder if we have to. Let us be slain in the floor if we have to. Let us shake up under the anointing and the power of God and stop wanting to be entertained. Whew. And what was the first thing he said? Have no other God's before me. Well, I, don't, I, I, I belong to the good old church of God for years. I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And we come out of Cleveland, Tennessee, and we're old-time church of God. I use nothing about the church of God. You can't tell me. Well, that's wonderful. But are you in a wilderness, in a new land today, with the way we've been hit? Has God proved himself to you? Have you been faithful to him and found him faithful to you? Have you been able to raise your hands in the presence of your home and worship the Lord and stay on fire for God? Or has depression? come in upon you and you don't know how to lift your head I'm here to tell you God is a God of the wilderness he's in the wilderness he's in the mountains he's in the valleys he's everywhere and he says I want to talk to you I want to converse with you hallelujah my Lord he's a jealous God too 
He don't want you to have anything that means more to you than him. He doesn't, can I just be me? He doesn't care if you like to play ball, but he don't want you to play ball more than you work for him. You say, well, you, you're old, sister, baby. I've got kids. And I've got grandkids. And I just had my first great-grandbaby. I know what they like to do. And they put all of their energy, all of their energy into everything they like. And there's nothing like young. I see a lot of young here this morning, so I'm going to get you while you're here. Because you may not come back the rest of the week after I'm here this morning. And I want to tell you, God is calling the young. He's calling to this generation. You're the generation that's going to have to carry this gospel on. You're the generation that's going to have to raise up and let God talk to you. You're the generation God wants to fill with the power of the Holy Ghost. You're the generation that's got the answer to this lost and dying world. We cannot come Compromise with them. Now while Moses is on the mountain talking to God. While we're having revival in the church. While we're having special services. While we're pulling everything together and God's talking to somebody and blessing somebody. They were all around Doing their own thing below. Come on. Let me ask you something this morning. Do you feel like you just kind of done God a favor because you came to church this morning? Did you get up so well as Sunday? I, I've got to go to church. We've got to go to church now. Come on, kids. You just got to go to church. No, you don't got to. You get to. <laughs> oh, it's a privilege to go to the house of God and be ready to worship Him in spirit and truth. But they had forgotten that God had delivered them out of bondage. They had laid aside the things that, that God had done for them. That was in the past, and they were so upset at times, they said, let us go back to the garlic and the onions. Let us just go back to where we were enslaved. Sometimes uh, we want things the way we want it, when we want it, how we want it, but God has called you to be a blessing and a vessel to be used for His honor and for His glory. There they were with, around the golden calf. And they had the nerve. I'm going to get right down to where we are in America today in a minute. They had the nerve to say, This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. This is the God that set us free. We got people like people on TV saying, There's not only, Jesus ain't the only way. Some of our movie stars are saying, these people are crazy. We need to get rid of them. We've got one woman say, if you don't vote the way we want you to vote, we'll come looking for you when we get it. Come on. But this America that you live in, this country that you live in, has been set free and stabilized by the hand of Almighty God. And it's not about rights and lefts and right uh, republicans and democrats and donkeys and all of that it's not about that mm -mm. it's about good and evil it's about black and white it's about not living in the gray area it's about raising your children to know the fear of the lord it's about still being saved by the blood of jesus christ for no man cometh unto the father except the father draw him it's about being filled with the power of the holy ghost it's about healing of the body it's about worshiping my god someone help me Worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. It's about being set free from your drugs and your sexual addictions. You can't run with the world and walk with God. He's a jealous God. You can't flirt, flirt with the things of this life and, and do a little of this. And I don't, I, this is not in my notes. 
This is not my notes. It ain't the way I planned to go this morning. I'm going to follow the Holy Ghost if I don't follow anybody else. You can't run after the things of this world. Smoke a little rope here and drink a little drink there. And they tell you it don't matter. And these, these old foggy Pentecostal people don't know what they're talking about. God is coming after a church that's washed in the blood of the Lamb and is ready. And it's right at your doorstep. Oh, God. God doesn't want to share you. God's not going to share you. He'll not share his glory. He'll not share his people. He'll not share anything he gives you. You either live for God or you don't. They were, the way they were living was not helping them. Let me ask you something this morning. How you are living, is it helping you? I'm the youngest of 10 kids. Now, I used to be real little. <laughs> Those days are gone. But, <laughs> but I was spunky. I was going to take the world by the tail, you know. And you know, God had to harness me. Mom would pray. She'd say, you be in by 1030. I'd come in at 11 just to prove to her. That I wasn't going to be there at 1030. And you know what I heard, brother? I heard her say, oh, God, get a hold of Betty Jean. God, touch her. God, you know you've got your hand on her. Lord, wake her up. Shake her. Get a hold of her. And I said, my Lord, ain't she ever going to go to sleep? Ain't she ever going to give up? I heard my name called night after night. Not that's not what really done it. I'll tell you what's really done it. When God rolled back the heavens and he heard her prayer. Hallelujah. He heard what, whoo, he heard what she was asking and God did what he asked her to do. I'm telling you, whatever you need from the Lord, he'll do it. But you've got to let him talk to you in the wilderness. And they wanted Moses to do the talking. Now, this is a complete different onslaught. And you may understand, we live in a world now that we want someone to prophesy to us. Give us a preacher that can tell us how much money we got in our pocket. Who cares? What good will that do for saving a soul? We want to be entertained in the gospel. We want the singing to be just so. We want everything to be just high and mighty sometimes. But God is calling us back to the God of our childhoods. He's calling us back to raise up the standards of the old rugged cross. He's calling us back to let us let us know and let our children know that no one else, there's none like him. And no one else will walk with you like he does. And no one else will talk with you like he does. And you may think you're real tough and you've got it all together. But I'm going to tell you when you stand in the presence of a holy God, you'll be like the children of Israel. You'll be scared to death and you say, so Somebody talk to God for me. He tried to get them to hear God. But the people said, no, no. You, you, you talk to him. You talk to him. And so sometimes I think, and I want, I want to bring this out today. Above everything else, if you don't get anything else, I want you to get this. You have to prioritize where you're going to put God. In your life. And you cannot. Have a relationship with God. Through other people. Have you heard people say. You know the greatest person in the world. Is the dead person. Did you ever notice that? I don't know what you thought. You may tell him boy don't ever invite her back again. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody goes up. He may have whipped his kids and spent his money. They didn't have no groceries and clothes and everything. Oh, he's a good old boy. But he's a good old boy. Everybody goes to heaven, you know. <laughs> you can't. And have you heard it said, if so and so don't go to heaven, there ain't no need of me trying. 
No man, if sister so-and-so don't make it, I'm sure not going to make it. If brother Cornette don't make it, I'm still going to make it. Come on. Now let me tell you, folks, we cannot live for God through other people. We cannot live for, through God, with, for God for our traditions. We can't live for God because grandma and grandpa set the standards and put the cornerstones in the church. I'm glad they did. They paved the way. But there's another stone that came rolling out of Babylon, tearing down the kingdoms of this world. And he is the chief cornerstone for our lives. And we must build up on the rock Christ Jesus. A relationship has two sides. It's not all about what you get from somebody when you have a relationship with them. It's what you give into it. And I find people want God to heal the children when they're sick. They want God to deliver their sons and their daughters when they're in trouble. But when everything works out, we forget what God has done. We don't mean to. What makes us do that? What makes us that way? I'll tell you what. The Bible says, I know that you're just dust. And I know that you're just humanity. But oh, if that dust will cry out to God, he will mold it and make it into a vessel of honor for his glory. Whoo, hallelujah. You see, commandments are not given because God don't like you. Commandments are not given because he's against you. Rules are not made because everybody's trying to tell you what to do. Somebody is watching out for your future. God's looking down the road. He sees what the enemy has planned and he wants to deter it. He knows the end from the beginning. I was in the revival one time. Literally, years, years ago. A lot of young people in it. You know, we used to have it years ago. We don't have it so much now, but a lot of times they'd come to revivals and they'd make fun and carry on and cause a lot of commotion because you were preaching the word of God. And some boys in a car drove up. At this church, they had, old country church, had windows all the way to the ground. They'd drive the car right up to the windows and they could sit on the hood of the car stick their nose in and they wouldn't have to come in church to listen anybody know what I'm talking about <laughs> and one of them got in the car after service and pulled up to the gas station he said how much gas you want he said I want enough gas to go to hell on and right around the curve he had just enough gas to go wherever it was he went because he was taken into eternity. You see, God is not going to share us with anyone else. You determine the depth of your relationship. Not the preacher. Oh, if I like the preacher better, I'd, I'd get in and do more. If I like the Sunday school teacher, I'd come to Sunday school. If I like the events better, I'd get over and all involved. But you see, you determine. Your relationship with God. You and you alone. So in marriages, it's relationship where there's no other lovers. In friendships, it's relationships that are loyal and loving at all times. And there's no betrayal because a friend loveth at all times. In our spiritual relationships, it's no other God. Come on. He is God. <laughs> he is God. <laughs> he, whoo, I said he is God, the King of glory. Yay and amen. Oh, my God. So it comes down to this scripture that I saw, and I could not believe it. I had overlooked this scripture. Brother Cornette, I, I know I've read the Bible through and through, but I... I, I looked at this scripture as I was studying, and, and I don't know if you can get it up there or not, Psalms 103 and 7, 
But I, I, it says, I, I want you to know the difference in hearing about someone and having a relationship with them. Here was the difference. Here was the difference. He made known his ways unto Moses. Why? Because Moses would talk with him. Moses would spend time with him. Moses would go up the mountain. Another, nobody else came before God. But to the children of Israel, we say, well, that was pretty good. His acts unto the children of Israel. Now, do you just want to know what God does? Or do you want to know him? Do you want to know him? Do you want to know the power of God? A fresh and anew like we used to? Do you want to be able to raise your hands and feel the presence of God flowing all over your head wherever you are? I told them in this COVID thing, I, I guess I've lost my mind. I've had more church at home by myself than I ever had any other time. I've even locked my door because my brother lives up the road and he has a tendency just to walk in and say, I'm here. And I didn't want him to think I'd lost my mind, so he had to rattle the door before he could get in because I got to praying. I got to seeking God. I got to weeping. I got to raising my hands. I, I got to speaking in a heavenly language and praising God the Lord all by myself because it wasn't what was going on that made the difference he makes the difference his glory his power his anointing I want God to make his ways known unto me and unto the church. I long for old time revival. I long for an old time move of God. I long for people to forget about the clock and the time and the food and everything and say, oh God, if you don't come to our rescue, we are destitute. Can I tell you something this morning? If God doesn't come to our rescue, we're going to be destitute. Can I tell you this country is facing things like we've never seen it before? Can I tell you if certain people get in to, to office, uh, it's going to be war in the streets. It's going to be pandemonium. It's going to be martial law. And if others get in, I said, well, just let get in whoever. If one gets in, we'll have martial law. If the other one gets in, Jesus will come sooner. The Lord is at the door. And he says, behold. <laughs> Pay attention. Do I have your ear? I stand at the door and knock. He's not talking to the sinner there. He's talking to the church. He's talking to... He's talking to... Children of God. And he's saying, I, I want in. I want into your relationship. I want in the time you spend with your kids. I want into the events that you have to go to. I want into your time elements. I want into your plans. Don't leave me standing outside the door. I can't open it by myself. The handle is on the inside. You have to open the door and let me in so I can refresh you. Aren't you tired of the same old, same old? Aren't you weary with just doing the same thing over and over again and saying, I've been saved. See, sometimes we think revival's all for the sinner. No, we'll never get the sinner until the church gets excited and gets revived about the things of God. Man, we used to. Let me tell you, so I, I'm tired about the used to days. Well, we don't have nothing to talk about now, so we've got to talk about the used to. Ain't nothing going on now in most places. Dead on four o'clock in the morning in some places. <laughs> Woo! I get to go home after Wednesday. But I pray before I leave here. Come on, my satire. I said, I pray before I leave here that the power of God strikes us like a lightning bolt from heaven. And we say, God, I'm tired of the same. Meet with us. Touch us. You know what he says about you young men? He said, young men shall see visions. But you have to get close enough to him so he can give them to you. 
What about you old men? I can talk about the old. I'm there. Do you fall asleep watching the news so much that ain't nothing on your mind but the news, but Trump, but Biden, but whoever? I don't know who all is going anymore. I tell you what, I just let it all go. And you go to sleep with that on your mind, and God has, can't even crowd through. He could give you a dream if he wanted to. Come on. But, oh, he said, my old men shall dream dreams. Your life is not over. He's got a dream for you. <laughs> He's got a revelation for you. He's got visions for you. And you young ladies that are in this place, <laughs> on my handmaidens, I will. I will. Not maybe, or we hope so, but I will pour out my spirit saith the Lord and he turns right around you young people ought to be happy he hits you twice he said your sons and your daughters shall prophesy Woo! glory <laughs> hallelujah meet us in our wilderness Lord this wilderness of COVID this wilderness of mass wear a mask don't wear a mask stay home no you can go go in no go out you can come in no you can't come in I'm scared no I'm not scared I'm here to tell you God has not changed the world changes atmospheres change seasons change but God wants to talk to you on the mountain. Sister, come to the piano for me if you would. I said, God wants to talk to you personally. He wants to meet with you. We used to sing an old song that says, how long has it been since you talked with the Lord and you told him your heart's hidden secrets. How long since you knew that he would carry you and he would hear you the whole night through? Do you know what you're facing in this day and hour? You're facing devils, demons, powers of evil like we've never faced it before. Hey, let me tell you, the election isn't the big thing. The election is here, but it'll be gone. That too shall pass. But every demon of hell has been loosed upon this world. We have a generation that knows not God. Pray that'll sink into you this morning. You have a generation. For the most part, you can get out in the public, and it's nothing to get cussed out. You have a generation that shakes their fist in the face of authority. It says, we don't have to listen to you. We don't have to listen to the police. We don't have to listen to mom. We don't have to listen to teachers. We don't have to listen to nobody. And they say, we don't have to listen to God. You know what's happened? We've built our own golden calf. We've served our own God. But what is our golden calf? Your flesh. Your flesh. It's what I want when I want it it's how I feel I don't have time it's too hard when this thing first come out I'm glad I'm an evangelist now not a pastor <laughs> I saw people at Walmart that hadn't been to church for three or four weeks Listen, the devil's challenging you, folks. He's challenging the church. He's challenged you. And, and I said, well, where are you? well we, we can't come to church. I'm scared to death. You're shopping at Walmart. Oh, but we got to eat. I said, you got to eat spiritually, too, or you'll die.
Isn't it odd how we serve a God that has all power and created all things? If we do everything we're supposed to do and be like we're supposed to be, He will take care of us. Well, I know people that have died with it. Yes, and I do too. And it's real and it's out there. Cancer's out there. The flu is out there. Every disease in the world is out there. Every devil in hell is out there. Murderers are out there. Sex offenders are out there. Every kind of evil you can think of is out there. But you're going to have to bind yourself up in the love of God and say, revive me, Lord, one more time. If you miss this revival, you're going to miss something. Something's going to happen one night here, and you're going to say, you might know. I stayed home that night, and God came on the scene. Something happened. How long has it been since the Holy Ghost has shook you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet? I get hungry for His touch. Who did He I get hungry for His touch. How long has it been since you've prayed until the light shone through? Let me ask you, in this world that's so turned upside down right now this morning, where do you go from here? What do you do from here? Will you stand to your feet reverently this morning? What are we going to do? Can I tell you, it's never going to be as church as usual again. Our world has been changed forever. It'll never be the same. I wish things would get back to normal. I don't know what you consider normal, but they're not going back. Because the Antichrist of this world has risen up. He sent his forerunning Antichrist all through the nation. Many of them. And now it's affecting the church. I was pastoring a few years ago. Can you imagine that? And I looked at my church almost in a prophetic voice. I didn't even know I was going to say it. And I said, church, you're going to come to these doors one day, and they're going to be locked. Well, I was pastoring a country church that was 50, 60 years old, and the doors had never been locked. Sometimes they didn't even lock them when everybody went home. And some of them said, Sister Betty, these doors would never be locked. This, this area around here said they wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything like that. See, we think we're safe because we're in the country. Because we're in the suburbs. Because we're in the outer lying areas. But the devil knows where you are. And a few months ago, the governor said, lock the doors and a lady came to me the other day and she said oh my God I remember when you preached just not long ago that the doors were going to be locked you say well ours aren't locked now don't get overconfident because the devil is going about as a raging lion seeking whom he may devour And he knows God's got to get us through this wilderness. And he knows something that we're not paying any attention to. And we talked about it. He knows he has but a short time to work. And some of us think we're got forever. Especially if we're young. But just this year. uh, I'm going to make it by 12. (laughs) Just this year. My phone rang. Sister Betty, a young man I'd had in my youth group, a young man I'd taken to youth camp, a young man that I'd hugged his neck and prayed with in the altar. His mother said, he's hung himself. I found him in the garage this morning. I looked on his Facebook page and he was saying, I'm lonely and there's nobody to talk to and I need somebody. Will somebody please come over? And nobody paid any attention 
You say, well, why didn't you? Because I wasn't friends with him at the time. He, he'd left the church and gone way, way away, and I didn't even know where he was at. But when he committed suicide, Mama called me. I thought that was bad enough. Had a family call and say, Sister Betty, would you preach my son's funeral? Two little babies. Eric loved you. He couldn't sit in a church service without weeping. He'd come to the altar every time. But he had, you know, one of those kind that they let go and then they hold on and they let go and then they hold on. They're saved and then they're not going to be saved. They're going to walk and they're not going to walk. And he came home from work and told somebody, I don't feel good. Laid down 20 some years old and never woke That's just a few weeks ago. Where are you going from here? What are you going to do? Who are you going to lean on? Who are you going to put your confidence in? And by the way, well, my mom and my dad, they'll no, mom and dad's going to go home to be with the Lord. I tell you, my kids found that out. They thought their dad was going to live forever. I called them and told them their dad was dead. You could, I tell you, you'd have thought I dropped a brick. Nobody was expecting it. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised the rest of this day. You're here this morning not just because you chose. God has allowed you and he's asking you, where are you going to go from here? Cold church member, lukewarm church member, backslider, young, old. Where are you going to go from here? I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I've delivered my soul this morning. Lord, it hasn't even gone exactly like I wanted it to go. I didn't even use some of my notes, Lord. I I don't understand. But you do. You know who's here. And you know what they needed to hear. God, in the name of Jesus... I pray that you'll strike hearts this morning. Cause someone to tear down the strongholds. To return to the God of their childhood. To make a new consecration. To say, here I am, Lord. I realize the time is short. And I've got to do something from here. And that is, I have to live for you. I don't want anyone looking around. I'm not going to belabor the time. I'm not sorry for what I preached. I don't apologize for anything that I've said. Because I've told you the truth this morning. But if you're here this morning, and you say, I need prayer. I know I need prayer. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come pulling you out of your seat. I'm not going to overexpose you in any way. But I am interested, you know. And you say, I'm interested in my soul. I'm interested in my future. I'm interested in the walk I have with God or don't have with God. I'm interested in me and God in our relationship. Whether you're cold, lukewarm, indifferent, or backslid. Makes no difference. I want this revival to be a time when God revives me afresh and anew. Would you slip your hand up right now? Anybody in this place? Yes, I see that hand. Is there another? I see hands going up. Hands are going up all over this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you just begin to say praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Folks, we're looking for a dynamite something. And people, you can't jump the pews and shout and twirl around and have the power of God until you've got something to shout about. We've got to be in a right place and relationship with God anybody else quickly before we pray this morning now I know we're supposed to be socially distant but this altar is big enough that you can get far enough away if you want to come and pray this morning it's up to you you know I used to be one of those now I'm still not past obeying the Lord and laying my hand on somebody and praying for them 
if God leads me to them. But I used to be one of those preachers that just walk. You know, you remember them? They go pull people out of their seats and all that. I found out something. The Lord spoke to me one day and said, Betty, if my spirit can't move them, you can't. If the Holy Spirit can't touch you, I can't. If the power of God doesn't mean all that much to you right now, I'm not going to mean anything to you. But if God has spoke to you this morning and you feel like you need to pray, there are people here, me for one, that would like to pray with you. Father, in Jesus' name, I open these altars this morning. Now, some would say, God, if I walk up there so-and-so, I think so-and-so, Lord, help us just lay our pride and everything aside. Help us to lay everything to the side, Lord, and realize it's just what it, the relationship is with you that's all that's counting. Lord, these that raise their hands this morning, I ask in the name of Jesus that you'll move in their hearts and lives. God, I can't change their circumstances. If they're unsaved, I can't save them. If they're cold, I can't warm them up. Lord, I cannot do anything but just preach your word and you send your word and you heal. You send your word and you save. And that's how it's done. God, send your word to their lives this morning. Before this revival is over, God, I pray that you do a work that no man can take credit for and no arm of flesh can take praise for. Move in this church of God church that has known and does know the power of God. Oh, will you just wait on the Holy Spirit just for a moment? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Will you just lift your hands and worship him just for a moment? He lifted two hands for you at Calvary. Can you just lift one hand this morning and say, I praise you, Lord. I give you honor. I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit's in this place, folks. He did all about satire. The Holy Ghost is in this place. God is talking to people. He's moving between the seats and up and down the pews. God is moving. Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I give you honor. I give you honor. I give your presence honor. Oh, I give you glory and honor this morning, Jesus. Oh, little, little boy, God's got something in store this week. Should this week tarry, God has something in store. How many of you are going to say, Sister Betty, I'm going to do my best to be in revival this week. Ooh, I see those hands. I see those hands and God sees them. And I may not know you, but he does. He'll come get you. <laughs> Can I tell you I love you? Can I tell you you're God's people and I'm part of your family? Guess what? I'm part of your family. You're meeting a new member of the family today. And I'm meeting members of my family. And I appreciate you. I appreciate this spirit of worship that's here this morning. Ooh. Where are you going to go from here? Where are you going to go from here? I feel led to ask all of our children, young people, to come up to the altar right now would you just step out and come and I'm going to ask parents to come with our young people I'm proud of our kids but our generation is being lied to a demonic spirits have been launched against our youth to lie to them to put anger and hatred but I'm praying today for a Holy Ghost covering we have we have got energetic talented, gifted young people here. The, I'm amazed by the gifts and abilities of our youth. 
Guys, would you turn around and let's just kneel at the altar. I'm going to kneel with you. Parents, would you get behind your family, your children? We're going to pray. We're going to offer ourselves to the Lord. Let's kneel before the Lord right now. And we worship the Lord. God, we worship you right now. Father, we offer ourselves to you. Holy God, you're the God of truth. You're the God of truth. Jesus, you said you are the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, I thank you for our young people. I thank you for their talents and for their abilities, God. I thank you for their heart. God, they have tender hearts. They love you. They love people, Lord. God, I thank you for our children, Lord. Lord, yes, their Lord. gifts and abilities. Use me. Use me. Lord, we pray a covering, a shield of truth over them. Oh, God, I pray for a shield of truth over our young people, Lord. God, make them strong. Make them mighty warriors in the kingdom of heaven, Lord, to fight the good fight of faith and truth, Lord. Bless them and guide them, dear God, in your ways as Moses as you showed Moses your ways. God, I pray that you will show our young people your ways. God, anoint them and bless them, Lord. And Lord, we, we speak a rebuke against the spirit of lies. The devil is a liar and he's the father of lies. But Jesus, you're the absolute truth. God, put a covering over our young people, Lord. Bless them and make them, Lord, warriors of the truth, Lord, that are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, nor of its power, nor of its might. Guide their minds and their spirits, we pray, dear Jesus. Lord, I see in every one of them gifts and abilities given from you above, Lord. Talents, Lord. We're so proud of our young people. So proud, dear God, of their gifts, Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Bless them, we pray, dear Jesus. Oh, thank you, dear Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What an amazing, amazing group of young people you have blessed us with, Father. Oh, thank you, Lord. God, I pray that they offer themselves to you every day as living sacrifices, Lord. Bless them, we pray, dear Jesus. All of our families. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you. How many are proud of our young people? Thank God for them. Thank God for them. Praise God. Can you give the Lord praise for this message today? Come on up. We're going to anoint a prayer cloth right now. You know, we know the power of God in this church. Two of them, would you get them? We know the power of God. Could some of our ministers come up and anoint a prayer cloth? God is alive and well and active. God is at work. How many know God is at work? Amen? So would you stretch your hand this way for these two prayer cloths right now? God knows the need, and He is able to meet it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we anoint these prayer cloths, God. God, we need You right now in a mighty way. Lord, to show Yourself and prove Yourself, Lord. God, how real and how awesome and mighty You are. And we believe, Lord, and are sure that You are God and You change not. You are the God that heals. And Lord, we pray for Your help right now for these needs that are represented. Lord, in these prayer cloths anointed by faith. And we agree together in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, for miracles to happen even now for your glory. Amen and amen. Can you say amen? All right. Sister Sheila Walters, we know her well. Would you anoint Peggy? She's standing in for Sheila, member at the Main Street Church. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
God, as uh, Sister Peggy stands in proxy for Sister Walters, we ask right now, Lord, let Sister Sheila Walters feel your presence. Let your virtue flow out of the hem of her of, of your garment into her body, Lord, we pray. And help her, Lord. Lift her up, Lord, to your glory and your honor and your praise, Lord. Even now, Lord, as we speak, Lord, it is already done, Lord. We thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What an awesome God we serve. He he. He already has the answer on the way before we even get started praying. He's that awesome. He's that mighty. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Was there anyone else wanted to come for prayer? Let me tell you, time is short. Uh, just to hear the news or read the paper is enough to tell you this thing's about to wrap up. Jesus is about to come. And be ready and not only get ready and be ready, but stay ready. Can I get a witness to that today? Amen. Sister Betty, thank you for obeying the Holy Ghost today. Looking forward to the service tonight. How many are looking forward to the service tonight? Come back. Be ready. 6.30 all this week through Wednesday night. Revival. I need revival. We need revival. Amen. You ready for a blessing? The shepherd is about to put a blanket on you. A blanket of blessing. Are you ready? May the Lord bless you, watch over you, and keep you. May He cover you by His shield of faith, power, and might. May the shield of truth shine brightly. May God anoint you to be mighty warriors and soul winners, bringing the lost to Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you.